Ralph Leeds, Chairman of the Greater Jacksonville Onslow County Chamber of Commerce's Governmental Affairs Committee. On behalf of the Chamber's Governmental Affairs Committee, I want to thank you for joining us for our Forum Onslow. The Governmental Affairs Committee works with government agencies on issues that affect our business community. We monitor legislative issues that impact local business. We promote partnership between business, government, the military, and education. And we use these forums to create awareness on the topics that are important to our entire community. That's why our corporate sponsor, Duke Energy, has partnered with the Chamber on these forums for many years. They believe in a well-informed constituency is key to our democratic way of life. Ms. Billy Chalk, Duke Energy District Manager for Government and Community Relations and a member of our Chamber's Board of Directors will speak momentarily to express Duke Energy's thanks to the <coughs> candidates and the citizens participating in the forum. I would also like to thank our media sponsor, The Daily News, the City of Jacksonville for the use of their facilities, and especially the City of Jacksonville Media Services for broadcasting this very important forum. <coughs> And without further ado, a word from our sponsor. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Millie Chalk, and on behalf of Duke Energy, welcome to Forum Onslow. Duke Energy is proud to partner with the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce in sponsoring the forum, both focused on candidates running for House of Representatives. In this turbulent and uncertain world that we live in, we recognize voting is a privilege. And being an informed voter is our responsibility. I look forward to an informational session as our candidates outline their priorities for Onslow County. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Jason Harris. I'm a practicing attorney with Roundtree Losey. I have the pleasure of serving the public in my capacity as an attorney practicing in and around Onslow County, I suppose for more years than I'll admit at this point. Um, now, it's my honor uh, to serve as your moderator for this edition of Forum Onslow, a program, as previously mentioned, of the Governmental Affairs Committee of the Jacksonville Onslow Chamber of Commerce. Many thanks again to our forum sponsors, Duke Energy and The Daily News. Uh, our forum participants for this forum are competing for your vote for the House of Representatives. We have two seeking the seat for District 15 and two seeking the seat for District 16 here with us uh, today. While organized by the chamber, folks, this is the People's Forum designed for you based on input from you. I encourage all of our viewers to take seriously their constitutional right to vote and also particularly as we are here in Onslow County, home of Camp Lejeune, I extend a special thanks to our service members for their protection of that very important right to vote. We will meet the candidates shortly, but first, a note on the format. Uh, today's format will be a series of questions and answers. The public was previously provided with an opportunity to propose some questions, and I have considered those in preparing for this event. I will ask a question. Each candidate will get a chance to respond for up to one minute. This is a forum, not a debate. So your answers should be addressed to the public, not each other, please. Time is critical. When you see the red light uh, <coughs> candidates uh, and hear a buzzer, your time is up. Uh, and I realize this is the <coughs> call on the kettle black coming from an attorney, but please finish your sentence and stop talking. Uh, otherwise, uh, I'll get Ralph Leeds to do his Lester Holt impression. Uh, each candidate has two rebuttal cards. If any would like to, a chance to rebut, uh, or make a further statement, uh, that candidate is welcome to present their card by simply waving it, and you will be given up to another minute on the topic. Uh, finally, each candidate uh, towards the end will be, or at the end, will be given an opportunity to make a two-minute closing statement, uh, assuming time permits. So without further delay, shall we get to it? Let's do it. Let's start off uh, over on the House District 15 side of the equation with Mr. Shepard. Uh, Mr. Shepard, if you would please introduce yourself, tell us about your background and experience, and tell the audience briefly why you think they should vote for you. Uh, and after Mr. Shepard's response, we'll uh, sort of go from my left to my right uh, down the aisle uh, with our two House District 15 candidates, followed by our two House District 16 candidates. Mr. Shepard? Um, I'm Philip Shepard, and I live in Jacksonville, North Carolina. 
Uh, served 36 years with the federal government working with the Marine Corps. I retired from that. I'm also a bivocational pastor, served at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Jacksonville. And I've served three terms in the North Carolina House of Representatives from 2010. Uh, I look forward to serving the people again, if it's their desire. I have an open door policy, and I'm welcoming anyone to talk with me at any point in time. And I best try to reflect what the desires of the people in District 15 are in Onslow County when I vote in Raleigh and anything that I do in Raleigh. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Witten. Thank you, Jason. I'm Dan Witten. Uh, I'm a fiscally responsible, uh, socially responsible uh, Democrat here for House 15. Uh, I'm born and raised here in Jacksonville. Uh, I'm getting my bachelor's uh, in behavioral sciences with a concentration in public policy and administration. Um, I've spent nine years in health care with a good mixture of home health on up to the ER here at Onslow. Uh, and my big job there was psych placement. So if you came in suicidal, homicidal, psychotic, uh, no insurance, you, you came and saw me and I busted my butt to get you the help that you needed. And that does include our veterans here in the community. Uh, I have owned two small businesses, a medical massage clinic, uh, and I helped start a, uh, a medical staffing company up in Zebulon. Uh, and that was actually while I was uh, sleeping in my Jeep. So um, three things that I found very passionate is our public education system and our state employees, uh, addiction and mental health resources, in the, especially for our veterans, um, and accountable and transparent government. Uh, I'm not a politician. Uh, this is my first time doing this. Uh, I'm not a big fan of politics, to be honest. Uh, but there are some real issues that we should all come together on. I don't care what party you're part of. Have a conversation and uh, make some slight progress. Yeah, thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Mr. Whitney. Uh, over to the House District 16 side of the equation, Mr. Millis. Yes, sir. I'm Chris Millis. It's been my privilege and honor to serve the constituents of this 16th district uh, for the past two terms. Uh, I have been a resident of this district my entire life, uh, traversing our public schools here uh, from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. Uh, upon graduation, I went off to NC State University where I studied civil engineering and had the opportunity of graduating Val Victorian uh, from that university. Uh, upon graduation, I've came back to this district where I'm blessed uh, with my wife and our three children. I'm a practicing civil engineer who uh, early on in life uh, saw uh, the overreaching aspects of government, the heavy burden of taxation, and I decided to take the frustration of common everyday citizens and to translate that into meaningful action by serving in Raleigh. Uh, consistently, I've stood against cronyism. Uh, I've stood for the citizens in a government that is actually working for we, the people, and not for special interest. Uh, I have main, remained committed to that uh, my two terms and have given the opportunity to serve once again. I will continue to re remain committed uh, to the citizens and no one else. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, and I hopefully my heart is reflected in, in uh, this forum here about how I really want all individuals in this district to have greater opportunities to prosper. Thank you, Mr. Millis. Mr. Unger. Thank you for the opportunity to come today. Um, I have a uh, bachelor's in political science from Kalamazoo College and a master's in management um, from Nazareth College in Michigan. I've lived in this area and worked in this area for the past 30 years, living or working in Onslow County or Pender County. I uh, started and ran Tops of Voice newspaper uh, where I did a lot of public service work and investigative reporting. Today, I work for the town of Surf City, running their, their um, sports programs and park and recreation, serving over 2,000 youth and adults. Um, I will provide a different approach in Raleigh if elected. I support, strongly support education and the environment and environmental protection. Um, I present a clear alternative to Mr. Millis, who is a very worthy um, uh, opponent, and I ask for your support in the upcoming election. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, our next question for the candidates is, uh, what are the most important bills that you intend to propose or oppose in Raleigh? What will you do up in Raleigh to ensure that bills get passed for their intended purpose without tagging on additional provisions by way of compromise? And why don't we have Mr. Witten kick this one off, please? Uh, one of the big things that, uh, that I would love to do is get there, and uh, you don't see much proactive leadership. Uh, just crossing the party lines, finding people who you can connect with. Uh, you will never agree with everybody, but if you make that proactive effort to, uh, to build those bridges, you can get things done. 
Uh, I've done that for this community uh, for several years now and it, within my own life as well. Um, I really want to see Onzo County in the drug treatment court program that was established several years ago that it was excluded from. Uh, and this program is, uh, is good for getting people who are using or being or selling drugs off the streets, out of the jails, and, 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 and into rehab uh, to transition back to the community. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that's how you build bridges. You make progress by being the change, stepping aside, uh, getting out of your safety sandbox, uh, and uh, finding that common core and making progress with that. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, as your state house representative, the greatest power that you all as citizens give us is the power to tax and the power to spend. So I believe the greatest aspects of a legislation that our representation should be focused on is the budget bill, uh, making sure that your tax dollars are being spent properly within the role of government, not being spent on matters that aren't the purview of, of state government. I'm talking about justice and public safety. I'm speaking about education and public infrastructure. Uh, that's the most important piece of legislation that we all uh, can actually have a strong uh, voice and actually have a strong vote on, uh, on behalf of the citizen. Not only that, in terms of other pieces of legislation, our state actually has impacted nearly 10% of our state budget, which is about $2 billion per year on the cost of illegal immigration. There's no doubt we need further strengthening uh, of our protection in regard to that issue. Why it's a federal matter if the federal government does not step up and protect our state taxpayers from that 10% of our overall state budget, there's going to be continued demise. And I would like for that, um, those monies to actually go into justice, public safety, as well as further aspects of education. Thank you. Mr. Unger? This is a little bit different than everyone else, but I really feel that we need to promote the nonpartisan um, creation of election districts. We need to be able to have the opportunity so that we have competitive districts for both parties to run in. Right now, we have very few competitive districts. And if we, if we find a way to do that through a nonpartisan panel, that will improve our election system and our democratic process. Um, I also would like to see the opportunity for more normal working people to be able to run for the legislature. Right now, you've got to be independently wealthy or retired. If I get elected, I'm going to have to quit my job. I'm going to have to leave a job that pays me $40,000 a year plus benefits. It may not seem like much, but I'm going to have to quit. And we need to provide the opportunity for ordinary citizens to run for office. Lastly, I think we've got to repeal HB2. It's cost the state millions and millions of dollars, discriminatory legislation that has totally uh, totally uncalled for, and uh, this is a matter of civil rights. And I know we're going to cover HB2. I know, no but I think, I think it's important for me to say it in my opening statement, too. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Mr. Shepard, we're talking about uh, what's important to propose or oppose in Raleigh. As far as bills are concerned, I'd like to continue to work on bills that will help the average taxpayer in this state, our small businesses and corporations. We've worked real hard since 2010. Uh, to get North Carolina into position to be competitive again. And we are competitive because we've done some deregulation. At one time, we had regulations on the books that were more stringent than the federal codes. So you know how stringent they were. And we've done away with some of those, and we've worked with the public and the environmentalists to find some compromises on those. Uh, as Representative Miller said, the budget is another area that we have to work real hard on. And I will say that there was bipartisan effort this past year. It passed 92 to 23 with a lot of our Democratic colleagues voting for the budget this past year because it was a good common sense budget. It was in the best interest of everyone involved and we all worked together to come to those resolutions. Uh, many times we have people from across the aisle that vote with us and vice versa if the, if the, the bills that are proposed are good for common sense legislation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the economy. I think each of you has uh, uh, put your finger on it to some degree, so let me pinpoint down and drill a little bit more. Uh, Mr. Millis, we're going to start with you on this question concerning the economy. What do you perceive to be your district's most critical economic stimulator, and what would you do to protect and grow that stimulator? Uh, great question. There's no doubt what actually leads to strong economic growth for all individuals uh, in the district that I have the privilege to represent is for them to be able to keep more of their own money and for them to be able to choose how to spend their own dollars than any government bureaucrat or any politician. 
There is no doubt that that is what's led to the prosperity here in North Carolina. We're actually outpacing the nation on every economic measure, and it's been all because of the fact that we've allowed the citizens the ability to choose uh, rather than having carve-outs and loopholes for special interest, giving money back to we the people and allowing us to actually decide how those monies are spent. Not only does 100% of our dollars go to the cause that we want it to go to, but also it's is spent effectively and efficiently. Any time that government spends money, it is the action of other people spending other people's money on other people. I think we need to leave more dollars in the hands of the taxpayers, and as what's happened over the last three and a half years, we'll continue to see economic prosperity here in this state. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Unger, the economy. The economy. First of all, we've got to look at the infrastructure. Uh, we've got to look at long-term opportunities to build railroads, to build highways, to build parks, to, to have that kind of focus. That's going to come back to us in the economy. The other thing is we've got to improve our education system, devote more money to um, our secondary education programs, because um, that's going to come back to the economy too. And we've got to look at job creation programs. It's very, very important um, in our, especially our lower income areas, uh, to provide opportunities for, for work and to put people to work. And that ties back into the infrastructure. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. Shepard, over to you on the economy. Once again, I'd like to say that a lot of the policies that we've enacted since 2010 have been good for small business and good for corporations. Um, we dropped the uh, corporate tax rate from only 7%. In 2017, it will drop to 3%. Personal income tax rate has dropped from seven, uh, almost 7% uh, down to 55 so with those items, as Representative Millis has said, we're allowing the people to put more money in their pockets. It allows small business to go out and invest the monies that they do receive into other job creations and so forth. Also, as a transportation chair, we've worked real hard to provide transportation infrastructure for our communities, highways, roads, ports. We've spent $32 million more million this past year in the transportation budget for highways and roads and so forth, which will also help draw business back to our counties here in this district. And we need to continue to work with the Chamber of Commerce and our business entities uh, to make sure that we're doing all that we can to draw uh, jobs to this area. Thank you. Mr. Witten, the question is, what do you perceive to be your district's most critical economic stimulator, and what would you do to protect and grow it? Uh, I want to see a better quality of life. Quality of life is what brings in new jobs and new industry into any kind of community. Uh, and under quality of life, you have the health care of the people. A, a healthy community is a productive community. They get healthy mentally, mind, body, and spirit, and they go to work. Um, and making sure that our education is uh, above par with that. Uh, employers and, uh, and they want to see an a intelligent and educated community uh, to be able to come here and to employ those, those individuals. Uh, just because you bring in uh, three or four different Walmarts to create jobs does not mean, mean that you are actually helping the economy in that community. Um, and I do commend Mr. Shepard on the transportation. That's a huge issue in this community is getting to and from places. Uh, and he has done a, a decent job, well, excuse me, a good job with that and those, are th those initiatives. Um, quality of life, that's where it starts. And without companies, without uh, look, without people, there is no industry. You've got to take care of the people. Outstanding. Um, we're going to get on to our fourth question. I just want to remind our candidates about their rebuttal cards. Uh, feel free to toss those whenever you might like. Um, this next question uh, is going to go to Mr. Unger to start off with. Uh, obviously, all of our candidates will have an opportunity to respond to it, but it's <clears throat> fitting this one comes to you in light of your earlier comments, Mr. Unger. Uh, terms for politicians. In the private sector, generally the concept of employment at will applies, and for the most part, gone are the days when someone <clears throat> will hold a single job for their entire career. Are term limits for politicians appropriate? And in a related question, are compensation and benefits to politicians appropriate at all, and if so, to what extent? Well, that's a two-part question, right? Uh, first of all, I, I'm going to break with some of my Democratic colleagues. I don't think term limits are appropriate because I don't think they're constitutional. Uh, there's nothing uh, that's been uh, put out there that allows 
us to limit terms. The only thing I know of is you can limit the term of the president, and that was by constitutional amendment. And while I would hope that when someone serves a certain period of time, they step down, even when the Republicans did it at the national level, it didn't work and they didn't step down. So I'm afraid, I, I don't think term limits are the solution. I think we have to look at other solutions and, and that has to be a voluntary thing. The other thing is if we want a, a more varied legislature and not just a, a bunch of lawyers and retirees and people who are economically well off, we're going to have to provide better compensation. Either that or we need to shorten the amount of time um, that we serve in Raleigh. Uh, right now, the legislature is, is, is very monolithic. It's, it's, it's served by people who can afford to take six months away from the job. And we, we, that's, that's simply not right. Thank you. Shepard, term limits and compensation to politicians. Well, basically, I believe term limits should be uh, decided by the voters. The voters decide to go to the polls, and if they decide that I'm not fit to go back and I can't serve another two years. Um, with the North Carolina House and the North Carolina Senate, State House and Senate, you serve two-year terms. Uh, so it seems like sometimes uh, by the time that uh, we're elected and we're trying to serve the public, we're back raising money and running again. Uh, I would like to see those terms maybe increased to four years, if possible, but right now they are two. So I'd rather leave the term limits up to the voters, let the voters decide if they think you should go back or not go back, uh, and so forth. The compensation is what it is. Um, we're probably one of the lowest paid legislators in uh, the United States. Um, and with that being said and done, maybe something does need to be uh, done to address that, maybe an increase in per diem and so forth. Um, but uh, I knew what that was going in, and I, I took it that way. And, and so it's just an honor for me to serve. And, and until someone decides it should be different, then I'll take it like that. Mr. Whitman, Mr. Witten, term limits. Sure. Uh, I want just two terms, and that's it. I'm gone. Uh, I think that there should be a term limit. Uh, you should not be a career politician because to me you lose sight of what you're up there for. Uh, I also want, I would love to bring in some youth, have a mentorship program, bring in SGA groups, student government groups from high schools, show them what's going on, show them the process, and get our young voters and more involved with the process. Uh, there's a huge gap in that area. Um, in regards to pay, uh, I could make $9 an hour, 20 hours a week right now. So I knew I was getting you know, myself into, it's not about the money, it's, it's about advocating for the people. Um, but there has to be a, a balance as well. You have to be able to, to take care of yourself, be healthy, be fit, uh, mind, body, and spirit, and pay your bills and school loans. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I got distracted when I heard school loans, sorry. Um, <laughs> Mr. Millis, term limits and compensation to politicians. Yes, sir. When I first stepped up to put my name on the ballot to earn your vote, I committed to term limits. As a matter of fact, you can visit millisforncehouse.com and you ac actually can see that term limit pledge that I put up to the voters. There's pros and cons on both sides of the aspect, but I believe in actually supporting elected officials who do believe in term limits because there is a power of incumbency, and I think that good leadership is something that has to be earned by way of the people, and I look forward to every single election to come uh, before you all, espouse what I believe, and if you desire to have those beliefs actually led upon, voiced, and voted upon in Raleigh, I'm happy to serve. Uh, so I do, uh, and I am a supporter of self-imposed term limits by legislators. In terms of compensation, uh, I have a wife and three kids. I will never complain about the pay for the General Assembly, and neither will I ever vote to increase it. It is a sacrifice, and it should be. Uh, there, is a, there is a need for a citizen legislature, but I believe that the way you take care of it is you just step up and you actually make those sacrifices. Thank you. All right, I see our first rebuttal card from Mr. Unger. It's no surprise that there's going to be some rebuttal, particularly on this topic. I, I note that the positions taken by our candidates are widely varied, so uh, I'm happy we've got some rebuttal. And the first one is by Mr. Unger. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, yes, it's a sacrifice and an honor to serve, but you've got to be able to survive also. And right now, we don't have folks in the General Assembly from all walks of life. And without providing better compensation, we're not going to have them. Um, I told you personally, I will have to leave my job. And I will open an office to, um, to, to uh, reach constituents, but I will leave my job. I will leave a, a good compensation, and uh, I will do my job as, as best as possible. But right now, 
our, our legislature represents only those who can afford to serve, and that simply is not right. In terms of length of term, I would favor some um, extending length of terms possibly to three years, um, maybe not four. It's good to run and have new opposition and new folks out there, um, but I would, I, would, I would look at that concept, and I think that that has some merit. Thank you. Thank you. Further on this topic? Seeing no rebuttal cards, you must be saving them for what you know is my next question on HB2. Uh, I've, call, I've heard that HB2 is known, well, of course it is known, as the Public Facilities Privacy and Security Act. I'm curious as to our candidates, and we're going to start this time back with Mr. Shepard, what does the law mean to you, and what is your position on what has been described as the bathroom bill? Well, first let me say that we would not have HB2 if the mayor of the Charlotte Mayor Roberts and the city council there had not overstepped their bounds. I really believe that what they did was not correct and that uh, in, in talking about this, a lot of people don't realize that the state of North Carolina, we charter towns and cities. The General Assembly does that. So they're chartered at the discretion of the North Carolina General Assembly. And when this bill was passed or their ordinance was passed, they knew there were going to be issues and there were people in the city of Charlotte that opposed what was being done, and that was all discussed. But they decided to go out on their own and to pass this bill, even though there was a lot of opposition from the rest of the state. So with that being said and done, you would not have HB2 if it wasn't for the mayor of Charlotte and the city council there that passed this bill, which I think was out of their parameters. Um, I support HB2. I think it's important that we protect young children and ladies in the bathrooms and so forth. Uh, I can't believe this was even being discussed or as a topic of conversation. Mr. Whitten, HB2. Thank you, Jason. Uh, HB2 is entirely irresponsible, and we cannot point our fingers at anybody else, whether it's towns, whenever we are uh, upholding our duties in the General Assembly. Um, Charlotte did not have to do what they did, that's, that's, that's fair, uh, but the General Assembly did not need to go into a special session uh, just for this matter. And I'd like to be clear, uh, House Bill 2 is inappropriately called the bathroom bill. There is more to it besides bathrooms. Uh, many people do not understand that. In fact, at Chili's a few months ago, I talked to a waitress and I actually showed her House Bill 2 and parts, uh, all the parts of it. And uh, she was like, well, this is just why I hate politics. Um, I, where is the, the special session for our veterans who are setting themselves on fire at the VA? Or the kids who are homeless in the school system, right? Which there's more than 200 right now. So uh, in the audio session, there was a suggestion to separate the bathroom portion fr from the rest. And down the line, down the party line, everybody said no. That shows intention and lack of responsibility. Mr. Mill, uh, I see Mr. Shepard showing his rebuttal flag. If you don't mind, let's, we're going to go through all of the candidates and we'll come back on the topic. Mr. Millis, HB2. Yes, sir. There is a tremendous amount of misrepresentation and misconception about what the legislation actually is. Make no mistake about it. The law that is here in North Carolina today is the same law that was in North Carolina decades upon decades before Charlotte took their action. Let's just understand what actually Charlotte did. And by way of it not just being in Charlotte, it's coming to a local city and a local government near you. Charlotte legally protected a biological man who just simply has to identify, says that I feel like a woman. And that biological man would have legal protection to be in the shower and the changing room next to your mother, your wives, and your daughters. That's what it did. We stood up for the rights of privacy in the most intimate of public situations for our children and for our loved ones. I'm proud of the vote that I took, and I will take it again and again and again. Our values are not for sale here in North Carolina, and if I'm a representative, I will continue to stand on principle over politics in every way. Mr. Unger, HB2. This is a law that didn't need to be passed because there was no reason for it in the first place. Um, it's total discriminatory. It's costing us tens of millions of dollars because the rest of the world has made North Carolina a laughing stock. The NCAA is pulled out. The NBA is pulled out. The rest of the world looks at us as discriminatory. This is no different than discrimi racial discrimination in the 1960s. Um, we have hundreds 
of other municipalities who have passed similar laws without similar um, blowback. In other states, the governors have shown um, the maturity and the legislators have shown the maturity not to move in this direction. It's just pure discrimination and there is no reason for it to exist. Whether Charlotte passed it or not, I'm concerned about the overreach of the legislature. Sure, they have the power to tell the municipalities what to do and what not to do, but in this case, they certainly shouldn't have reacted in this way. And I totally support the repeal of HB2 in uh, as, as quickly as possible because it's costing us millions and millions of dollars and it's simply wrong. Mr. Shepard, you posed yes, a sir, I'd like to rebuttal if I could. Uh, basically, on some of the comments that have been made, uh, this was a bipartisan effort also. We had several colleagues that were on the other side of the aisle that voted with us. Several of our uh, African-American colleagues in eastern North Carolina voted with us on this because we know it was the right thing to do. Uh, as far as the VA and, and having a special session for VA, that's a federal item. The federal government should be having the special sessions when it comes to VA issues and so forth. Um, and we gave the mayor of uh, Charlotte and the city council of Charlotte a few weeks ago an opportunity to go back and drop their ordinance and do the right thing. And they both, and they all chose not to do that. Even though the mayor uh, met with the governor and so on and so forth, she, she still chose to use this as a political item. And I'm like Representative Millis and most of my colleagues, we did the right thing. If they had not overstepped their boundaries and done the wrong thing, we would not have HB2 today. And I would continue to support that. And I will continue to vote to support what my constituents believe is the right thing to do. I don't want the NBA or anyone else determining what my moral code is in the state of North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Shepard. I know Mr. Millis raised a flag, but let's stay over in the in the District 15 uh, section for a minute. Mr. Whitten, you raised yours as well. Rebuttal on HB uh, on HB2, sir. Thank you. Uh, in college, I've learned that you cannot make legislation that cannot be enforced. And as a scenario, if you have a full, and I don't understand the transgender. I'll be honest, I don't get that. But if you have a female to male fully changed, looks like a male, but except for the genitalia area and they have to go to a female's restroom. Does it create more problems than it's trying to solve? So, sure, let's have a conversation. Let's bring it, but it has to be academic, educational, and uh, absolutely bipartisan. But the way that the General Assembly pulled, pulled out of their behinds the short session, uh, the special, excuse me, the special session was, was how it was done was, was irresponsible. Um, and you have to beat the change. You cannot just take one issue scare people with rhetoric that, that, that comes from the medieval days uh, uh, and not tell what the entire bill is about. Mr. Millis. Yes, sir. I believe that private businesses have the freedom to choose what their policies are and that we as citizens, by way of our pocketbooks and our wallets, we can actually do business with those who actually share our values. What Charlotte did and what every local government will do if we do not stand on this legislation they actually mandated that all businesses are forced to legally protect a biological male to be in the shower, changing room, and locker room of your YWCA, of your target. Mandated. Not gave choice. Mandated. In, in addition about that, let me, let me just say this. You know, we're here defending a piece of legislation that has been incredibly misrepresented. But I want to say this. I'm grateful for the opportunity to even have the opportunity to have been in Raleigh, to stand for you all, not just you all, but the three children I have, I have two little daughters. I never thought that I would ever had to make that vote. And I'm grateful for you all for giving me the chance to make it on behalf of them. If this issue isn't a sign of the times, I don't know what is. I appreciate it. All right, Mr. Unger is gonna use his second and final rebuttal. I'll use it. <laughs> yes, sir. First of all, Donald Trump said, even the Trump Tower, uh, people can use the bathroom that they prefer and that they find most appropriate. There is no enforcement mechanism for this. There is no bathroom police sitting outside the bathrooms. This issue doesn't really exist, except that it was brought up as a phony issue um, to discriminate against one class of people. Uh, the courts are going to turn it down, just like they turned down um, 
prohibit, you know, just like they supported uh, and allowed gay marriage, they're definitely going to turn this one down. And this is going to be a non-issue next time we, we talk about it two years from now. We've wasted so much time talking about it, arguing about it, we've wasted millions and millions of dollars. And if we think we are going to be business friendly in North Carolina, this is not a way of being business friendly. This is a way of costing taxpayers millions of dollars with legislation uh, and with, uh, with defending this bill that is totally unnecessary. Thank you. Obviously a very hot button issue, uh, and we're going to stay with the hot button issues and get right after it here regarding police cameras and videos. We can no longer see police camera videos without a court order, at least as I understand the new, the new law. Uh, where do you stand on this, and what will be the impact locally on police and community relationships as well? Does the public deserve to know now, perhaps as a public safety measure and transparency matter, or should it, should it play out as essentially a judge might decide? Who should make that call, in your opinion? I believe this question is for Mr. Witten. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, I'm big on transparency. Um, that's very important in efforts to build trust between the people and our law enforcement officers. Um, however, there has to be a balance. If there's a situation that that camera has recorded, and uh, it will end up on Facebook somewhere, if it is just open loud to, uh, to the public, it could, I can see where it can really affect the outcome of that case or the safety of that individual who's on the camera. Uh, but there has to be a better balance between that. You can't just say here's everything or here's nothing. Uh, I think there, there could be better efforts to find that, that balance. Um, I think law enforcement should do a, a better job at con connecting and relating to the community. And I'm proud to say that, uh, that Chief Unero and Mr. Miller has done a great job uh, in this community with helping start that conversation, uh, especially with the Crisis uh, Prevention Coalition. Uh, and the CIT training for our law enforcement officers who are going into those first battles with uh, those crisis situations. Mr. Millis. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first and foremost, I want to make sure that we understand that the premise of the question is actually not correct. Uh, right now, uh, with the law that actually was passed by this General Assembly and I had the opportunity to vote on uh, was a law that actually established for the first time a process to where a police body camera video will be released to the public. Uh, prior to that law being passed, it was the decision of a politician and or the police chief of whether that actually <clears throat> body cam video would be passed or, or would be provided to the public. So now at least there is actually a legal process that actually forces the video to be released. I'm, mo I'm most supportive of transparency. I like the idea of the body cameras. That way you actually can actually see exactly what happened. It's no he said, she said. It is viewable. And uh, now for the first time, because of the legislature, there is a legal process. You're not depending on a politician or a uh, individual within law enforcement to make that decision. That decision will now be made by the courts, and I think that's a good thing. Mr. Unger, what do you think? Well, on I, police I th camera videos. I, I thank Chris for being part of the process. That at least has uh, tried to put something out there where we create a process for release. But I, I think, as a, as a former newspaper reporter, this stuff should be public. Um, police reports are public. Uh, highway patrol reports are public. Um, it, it's if the, if if there is a 9/11 call that's made public. This should be public too because it protects law enforcement and it protects the citizens on the street. Um, recently, the ACLU has provided some advice, which I, I think is totally positive. And that is, if you're witnessing an incident, pull out your cell phone and record it. You have the constitutional right to record what's going on. You can't be denied that right. And the more we release this information, the more it protects both law enforcement and it, and it protects citizens at large. And I think it should be part of the public record. Thank you. Mr. Shepard, police camera videos. Yes, sir. And, um, as Representative Miller said, we passed a bill this past session that uh, requires police camera videos to be used in the state of North Carolina. Along with that, I would like to say that was another bipartisan effort throughout the North Carolina General Assembly where Democrats and Republicans supported that because we realized it was something we needed to get ahead of the game on and do because of what we've seen in other areas in the rest of the country. Also, a lot of this has to do with communication. I believe it's up to our police force and law enforcement officers to communicate, and also for our, the victims involved to communicate. Um, the situation that just happened in Charlotte, 
Uh, it's sad any time anyone is killed, or whether by the police or anyone else. Uh, but I think we need to support our police as much as possible and make sure they're doing the right things, but support them when they are. And at the same time, we must realize that three-fourths of the people that came into Charlotte this past time were there from out of state or from someone else and were paid to come there and cause problems. And we shouldn't tolerate that either. Thank you. Thank you. You mentioned communication, and that's going to be a source of my next question. Uh, municipal broadband networks. Courts recently upheld laws that may slow or halt the growth of city-run Internet providers. Should our government compete with private Internet service providers, and if so, on what terms? What's the impact on relatively rural communities like some parts of uh, Onslow and Pender County, <coughs> your districts, uh, uh, in, in those regions? Because it could have an impact uh, in those areas. I'm going to throw this one out first to Mr. Millis. Yeah. A lot of times individuals have good intentions, and a lot of times with government, individuals have good intentions, and it sounds like a good thing. But when it comes to municipal broadband, any time that government acts outside of its proper role, those good intentions don't always lead to good results. So the answer is very clearly no. Leave it to the private sector. Uh, allow the private sector to actually provide broadband uh, all across the state, including those of us who are in rural areas. And uh, so I do not think it's a good idea. Uh, there's little left of the free market. Uh, we need to leave what is left uh, to the free market and let's have government focus on its proper, uh, proper role, which again is justice, public safety, education, infrastructure, and things to those matters. Now again, if it becomes where uh, broadband is, is brought into an aspect of infra infrastructure and the public consents to such with uh, private business, uh, that's one thing, but that's not currently what is being spoken about when you hear the phrase municipal broadband. It is government broadband, not with correlation of private businesses. Thank you. Mr. Unger? It's public broadband. It's not government broadband. Um, if you paid your broadband bill recently, it's outrageous. Uh, and, and I pay the cable company an outrageous amount every month. And um, we prov the gov governments provide trash service in some places. They provide fire protection. They provide law enforcement protection. Um, it's not unreasonable for the for government to provide broadband so that everybody has the opportunity um, in this time and age to uh, access uh, communication and, and access the internet. Uh, I, I don't see why it's such a big deal to protect the cable companies, the telephone companies um, uh, from providing this service if we can do so at the, at the municipal and the county level. And I think it's a good thing and I see no reason to limit the opportunity to do so because it helps the citizens at large. Thank you. And thank you. Mr. Shepard? Yes, sir. I'd rather see this done by the private enterprise as well. I do believe that we as state and state government can um, take care of the regulations and so forth that need to be taken care of to help private enterprise in order that they may be able to go out and provide broadband service and internet in different areas. There's an area here in Oslo County that I got an email on last week. They do not have it on one particular road. And I've been working in Raleigh with the, the people in Raleigh to see if we can work that out for them. Um, and, and they're working with us to do that. So I think that as long as we can provide the infrastructure and, and help with them with the regulations and so forth concerning that, that private enterprise can best, is best suited to handle these situations. Mr. Witten, what say you about municipal broadband networks? Uh, Internet is basically today's oxygen. You have to have it for school, jobs, uh, research, and, and so forth. I want to see how it would be paid for, uh, to be quite frank with you. Um, I know that if, uh, if there was a public service with the Internet, uh, it would take money uh, being spent for that out of the pockets of the individuals and put it back into the, the local economies. Uh, that is one perspective that I could see coming from that. Uh, but the internet, again, is, uh, is needed for, for today's functionality. Um, so I'm open to that conversation. Well, I thank all of our candidates. Um, we're going to move now to our final round, which is where each of you has an opportunity to make a closing statement to your uh, prospective constituents. You'll have up to two minutes to make this statement, and we're going to start this one with... Yes. Back to Mr. Unger. To I kick knew this you one off. All right. I'm very predictable that way. Sorry. That's okay. Creatures of habit. I, I consider it a privilege 
to run for office. I really applaud everyone who's come here today. I applaud everybody who's watching this on television and who is taking the time to understand the issues. This is government at work, and this is the people's involvement in government that's so important. Um, in terms of my election, um, I will work, I, I've said this before, I will t take this job as a full-time job. I will find a way to keep my head above water. I will open an office locally. Um, I, when I ran two years ago against Mr. Millis, um, I, we, we were underutilized in terms of resources. I went back and worked hard. I became chairman of the Pender County Democratic Party for a year while we formed infrastructure. Um, I'm so glad to see people involved in the political process, no matter how, what they believe in, to be involved, to getting people out to vote. And what I want to do is encourage folks to go out and vote this fall. It doesn't matter so much if you're for Hillary or you're for Trump. Look at the other candidates. Look at the candidates on the statewide level. Uh, look at who's running for governor. Look at who's running for local county commissioner. Be involved with the process. And I'm proud that I've been had the opportunity to be involved in this and to be able to step forward and present my views. Um, I believe strongly that We've got to uh, do things differently at the state level. I, I believe that the GOP at the state level has been very regressive. It's made our state a laughing stock. And we've got to elect Democrats. And I'm a Democrat. And I'm not afraid to say that. I'm a progressive Democrat. And the election of Democrats will halt this process and will restore North Carolina, uh, restore our educational process, and do good things for the people. And for that, again, I thank everyone for holding this forum today, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Steve Unger, your Democratic candidate from Hampstead for District 16. Uh, Mr. Shepard, turning it over to you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. First, I'd like to say it's been an honor and a privilege for me to serve the citizens of District 15 and the State House representatives the past three terms. Uh, I look back and I see what we've accomplished. And when I went there in 2010 with many of my other colleagues, we went, had one of the highest unemployment rates in the United States of America. Uh, we had millions of dollars in debt to the federal government for unemployment taxes and so forth that our businesses were paying uh, all the time. And it kept getting larger. We had uh, millions of dollars in debt to the federal government for Medicaid. Since then, we've changed the tax structure, and we've had, uh, increased um, uh, paying off some of that debt. Matter of fact, we paid off the unemployment uh, debt that we had. We paid off the Medicaid debt that we had in the state of North Carolina. Uh, we've, we've adjusted the corporate tax rate. We've dropped it. We dropped personal income tax. We dropped the sales tax that was on at that time. And we've also created more jobs. The unemployment rate in North Carolina now is something like 4.7%, which is one of the lowest in the country. Uh, we're ranked in the top five to do business with. We went from 44th uh, in the business climate down to like 11th in the country in business climate. And this has all happened since 2010. So we can say we may want to go back or we need to take a step back. I don't see why we want to take a step back. I think we've done a great job in bringing North Carolina back to where we need to be. People are working. We're providing jobs. We put $32 million more million in transportation infrastructure this past year. Uh, that being said and done, uh, we've spent more money on teachers' raises and helping education than there's ever been spent in the state since Governor Purdue was governor. And when I look at what we've done with the amount of money that we have to work with, I think we've done a good job, and I look forward to continuing those policies that will help North Carolina grow economically, help us to bring jobs in, and help the average taxpayer every day. And as far as the other issues in the state, I will continue to stand by what my moral code is, one that the NBA, uh, NCAA, or no one else can buy, but what I think is best for women and children and families in the state of North Carolina. And I thank you for that opportunity. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you've met your Republican candidate for District 15 House of Representatives, the incumbent Philip Shepard of Jacksonville. On to Mr. Witten. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, I thank you all for being here uh, and being involved with the process, like Mr. Unger said. Um, there's a dominant narrative that there is no poverty in Onslow County. And that's completely inaccurate. You can sit in the ER for one day or a whole week and you see the poverty. Uh, there are real issues that affect everyone, whether it's uh, whether they're white, black, uh, di different religions, uh, Social economic statuses, uh, party affiliations, the real problems, uh, addiction, mental health, 
uh, education, uh, jobs, and uh, it's time to stop following the leader and step up and have that conversation. Uh, one of the things I re really want to have take place is monthly town halls where the whole community can come to the town hall, see what their representative is doing, uh, put their hands on the actual bills, and cut through all the rhetoric and propaganda from either side of the track. I think that will go a long way with getting people back involved with politics. Um, again, without people, without healthy people, there are no, no corporations or small businesses. You've got to take care of people. Um, I'm open to, to conversations as long as there's no propaganda or rhetoric. It has to be academic and just common sense. Uh, I have made my fair share of, of mistakes as a human being, uh, but I'll tell you this, I, uh, my creator's plan is a tad bit bigger than my mistakes, and I really appreciate that. Uh, it's, and it's been a huge learning experience. Um, uh, being an advocate for addiction and mental health, uh, there has been six years of no proactive advocacy in the House floor uh, for the addiction and mental health. We have people dying every day, every week from opiate uh, overdoses, uh, and, my, and I've done my fair share of CPR in the, in the emergency room on people who have intentionally or unintentionally died. And my question is, where has been our representation for the past six years on these? Could these deaths have been avoided? Uh, so that's why I'm involved, uh, and I, I look forward to continuing the, the dialogue for the months to come. Ladies and gentlemen, you have met Dan Witten, uh, the Democratic candidate for House of Representatives in District 15. We're going to wrap up uh, hearing from our candidates now uh, with Chris Millis. Yeah. Thank you all for the opportunity to come and espouse what I believe in, uh, to espouse how I've used your voice and your vote while serving in Raleigh. Uh, I have clearly conveyed the principles that I actually have. Uh, you can actually read more about where I stand at millisforncehouse.com. I humbly ask for your vote, and I'm very grateful for have been have for actually been able to be to, to actually serve you uh, for this last uh, two terms. Uh, upon going to Raleigh, we had the 44th worst tax burden upon the citizen and all the nation. We're in the top 10 of the worst. We're now in the top 10 of the very best, to be seventh, as a matter of fact. That's more money for you guys to choose how to spend. As a result of those tax decreases and the prosperity that has come from such, we haven't had budget shortfalls. We've had surpluses because of those pro-growth uh, tax policies. With those surpluses, we've been prudent. We put aside money for a rainy day. We've invested more into education and justice and public safety and making sure that state employees' pay is not frozen like it was whenever I showed up uh, in Raleigh. Uh, we've also actually moved to stop raiding the highway fund. The very gas taxes we all pay that's supposed to go to transportation infrastructure. My colleagues and I took a stand this past session to stop a quarter of a billion dollars being raided from the highway fund. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a $1 billion bond in four years, interest free. That's leadership. And if given the opportunity to serve you guys once again, I will continue to be the voice for you all while you live, while you work your jobs, while you attend churches, while you raise families. I'll be your advocate in Raleigh, standing against cronyism, standing against special interests, and standing for you and we, the people. Thank you. Folks, you have just met your Republican incumbent candidate, Chris Millis of Hampstead. Uh, running for House of Representatives District 16. You've met all the candidates today. We thank you so very much to our forum participants. Uh, you at home, you here in the audience, our sponsors, Duke Energy and the Daily News. Uh, I'm going to turn it over in just a moment to Chamber President Lorette Legan, but before I do, uh, I want to say thank you all from your moderator, Jason Harris. I wish you all good day, and please go exercise your right to vote. Now your chamber president, Lorette Legan. Thank you, Jason. And I also want to say, Mr. Shepard, Mr. Witten, Mr. Millis, and Mr. Unger, 
Thank you for your willingness to serve our citizens. It is not an easy job, and I admire every one of you for running. Again, I would like to recognize our corporate sponsors, as Jason said, Duke Energy. And I want to say thank you to Ralph Leeds, the chair of the Chamber's Governmental Affairs Committee, for helping us with this. Our moderator did a wonderful job. Jason, thank you so much. And thanks to our form Onslow coordinator and the Chamber's operations director, Janet Bowen, our new timekeeper, the business services manager, Lisa Murabito, and thanks to Chamber staff members, Melissa Maloney and Sabrina Thomas for the things they did behind the scenes. If you missed any part of this forum onslow, just check the listings on G10 for the rebroadcast dates and times. And as Jason said, also remember, your vote does count. The one-stop voting begins on October 20th, and it will run through November 5th. Remember, you can one-stop vote at any location that is convenient for you. And those will be the Onslow County Board of Elections Office, the Jacksonville Commons Recreation Center, the Swans Swansboro Rotary Club building, and the Verona Baptist Church Fellowship Hall. Absentee ballots can be requested online or by phone at the um, elections office, and they must be turned in by 5 p.m. on November 8th. The voting polls will open at 6 a.m. on Election Day, November 8th, and will close at 7.30 p.m. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us, and this concludes our forum.